Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Building a Better Future, stories from t climate tech founders. We normally come to you live on a Wednesday, but today you're getting a bonus Friday episode from us as well. So lucky you. Um, throughout this series, we've been chatting to founders who are still in those exciting but challenging early years of startup life. And we've been exploring where their love for sustainability began, their journey to founding a company, and what challenges they have faced in those first few years as a founder. My name is Cherry, and I'm the founder of Above and Beyond Recruitment. Our business partners with climate tech startups, and we help them to develop their employer brand and then grow and scale their product and engineering teams. If this is your first time listening to the Building a Better Future series, then please go and check out some of our previous episodes. The video recordings are all on my LinkedIn page and on the Above and Beyond YouTube page, the link to which will be in the comments. And we have a podcast version available via Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Acast. So go and search for it there. Today, we are joined by Buffy Price, COO and co-founder of Carbon Re who are using AI technology to decarbonize the construction sector. You'll learn a lot more about exactly how they're doing this throughout today's episode, but suffice to say, they are probably the most impactful startup I have ever spoken to in terms of the sheer volume of carbon emissions that their technology can and will reduce. But Buffy is no stranger to impact. Throughout her career, she has worked on the most wonderful array of interesting and important projects. Everything from animal welfare to documentary filmmaking, sustainable development policy through to human rights and disaster relief. Um, I'm absolutely honoured to have Buffy with us today to share her journey, her career and her startup journey with us. Welcome, Buffy. Hi, Cherry. Thank you for having me on today. No problem. Absolute pleasure. Um, I'd like to start, as I always do, by going back to the beginning, um, back to those early years of your life, um, those sort of, you know, formation years, um, education, university, and just sort of understand that you've dedicated your entire working life to these really important causes. Where do you think the spark for that came from? Is it something you always knew you wanted to do? It really is. Uh, and honestly, I've, I've, I've pondered this quite a lot. Um, my, my father's a, a doctor, so the, the family GP in, in our a local town. My mum was a teacher, so I guess quite sort of um, uh, honourable professions in that that regard. Um, yeah. uh, but I've it also had a you know really uh, privileged and, and very lucky life. I'm the youngest of uh, of three. We had you know very traditional nuclear family, and I think a lot of the the opportunities to to, to work in sort of um, areas of justice and and, and support they don't always pay very well and actually having that support of a, of, a, of a family that I knew I'd never be homeless even if I was working for free that like volunteering on various projects and things like that that's a luxury and, and I also wanted to be able to, to sort of give back a little bit um, in, in that space as well so it's certainly something that has just been in, innate when I was little you know me and my sister used to make my my dad join friends of the earth and, and all, all sorts of charities um, and then um, uh, you know, just moving on from that, I have you know, a really deep sense of, of um, injustice and, uh, and it's something that really, really drives me. And if I, if I can give back in any way, um, I, I will, I'll try. I love that. I think that's a really important combination is in it seeing people in your life that you looked up to, your role models, your parents doing things that were giving back to the community in some way, combined with having that position of privilege that enabled you to to kind of choose those honorable yeah. routes we, we weren't like crazy rich by the way just <laughs> <laughs> the, the luxury of a, of a comfortable home um, yeah. certainly provides that backdrop to, to to be able to to give back if you can yeah but there's something also unique in the fact you recognize that because i think a lot of children perhaps even from that comfortable or from privileged background don't always recognize that position of privilege and the fact that they could and can use it for, for positive impacts that's amazing and then when you entered the world of work i mean did you have any kind of work experience leading up to your degree and then beyond or or did you just go to university and then and then move into work from there I know I, 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 I done pl did plenty of um, you know babysitting jobs and bar yeah. jobs and um, um, actually the, the the work ethic really came from 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 my dad. Um, both my parents had very poor, very working class um, upbringing, and they really encouraged the idea that work rewarded you. So when back in the day when you could work with, uh, when you were sort of under under sixteen and under, under eighteen. Um, 
my dad used to double any pocket money. Uh, we, we didn't get pocket money, but he'd double the money that we earned outside the house between the ages of 14 and 16. So then my brother was doing a paper round that got, you know, four pounds a week. Um, so he'd give him four pounds a week. So you didn't get money for nothing and you didn't get money for doing household chores, but it's sort of, it's sort of trying to instill a, a good economic sense in us um, and I was very lucky because I was uh, quite motivated <laughs> by the reward and got a really really decent sort of babysitting job and worked all my summers so it was all you know what what you could do in the in the 1990s to, to get extra pocket money and extra cash but it certainly drove that work ethic um, and I did want to become a doctor I did my, my A levels were sort of in sciences um, as when it came to it, I actually um, started uh, at Sussex University doing artificial intelligence and management studies. Um, so little did I know that my career would turn out to be uh, that I was managing an AI company. Um, but I was really a fish out of water in, in 1999. Um, there was 106 people, I think, doing sort of computer sciences and artificial intelligence at Sussex at the time. And I was one of a really, really small cohort of um, girls in that space. And I, I just... I, I didn't have the language to uh, sort of really identify why I felt so uncomfortable. Um, everyone was perfectly pleasant, but I just didn't fit in. Um, so I switched to, to neuroscience, which was absolute delight. I absolutely loved my degree. I just got so into it and threw myself into it. And, and you know, I always thought I'd, I'd um, you know, continue in the medical profession sort of th through, through that. Yeah. Um, but I very much sort of had a, a portfolio career to so sort of pulled out some of those examples and just taking the opportunities as they came um very much driven by you know I have turned down opportunities for quite sort of corporate roles that it didn't didn't speak to my heart um so that that sort of sense of injustice or trying to make social change um climate sustainability has always been there behind what um, I, I've chosen to do. Uh, but I did just have an opportunity to work for the Liberal Democrats. So I worked in the Houses of Parliament straight out of university, again, like just bum bumbling from, from place to place with these incredible opportunities that came my way. So I did that for three years. And as you mentioned, then I moved on to the Animal Welfare Foundation. It's the charity I, I managed for, for three years after that. Um, so yeah, no, my working career began quite young, but you know, in, 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 in the way that I think uh, uh, most people do sort of dip their toe into the working world. And pretty much since then, I haven't really looked back. That's amazing. And I love that concept of just following your passions. If something yeah. speaks to your heart and you love, and I think if you do put yourself out there and you're, you're outgoing and you speak to a lot of people and you do just find that path, don't you? You can, yeah. And, and generally, yeah, mostly that they, they, they sort of some personal recommendations, but I often did go into my roles um, on, a, on a short term contract, on a temporary contract, and they were made permanent and then moved up within the organisations I was in. So again, sort of didn't really have the confidence to, to apply for these jobs um, that seemed a bit sort of senior or a bit, um, bit beyond what my, my, I was very honest about my CV. If it said I had to have five years work experience, I, you know, I wouldn't apply for the job if it only had four and a half years work experience. Um, so, so I think that that movement within the organisations and getting that recommendation sort of helped me advance my career yeah yeah and was there ever a kind of end goal in mind to that point so you're following this intuition you're you're just doing what feels right and following the passion but did you have something in mind an end goal of this is the sort of thing I'd like to be doing did you ever no. in, in, did you ever know you wanted to run your own business for example absolutely no. not <laughs> no in fact it was something I was very sure I didn't want to do right. um, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Uh, now I'm here. I'm, I'm very glad it, it, it happened, but it did really feel like the steps I've taken. If I, if, I, if I look back over my CV, if I try and craft that narrative from, you know, doing artificial intelligence initially at university to where I am now, I can make it sound like this beautiful, um, very designed path. It really hasn't been like that um, consciously. But then, as you say, you know, you, you have these sort of these 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 direction that you're, you're the things that you do take and things you turn down obviously are um driven by your personality and your, your likes and dislikes and the people that you like working with yeah. um so the longest stint i had was at amnesty international uh where i was for seven years um again went in as a, a temp on sort of 12 pounds an hour just doing an admin job um left as a senior advisor to the senior leadership pro uh, to oh. the senior leadership team um so saw the whole gamut um of the organization there um and i've had some really really amazing bosses um and at amnesty international uh, richard eastman was my 
uh, the, the senior director, who was my direct boss there. Um, and um, we used to, we were working in the, the operations of the um, uh, department and we had these um, uh, talks from other parts of Amnesty International to, to make us, you know, the people who are working on the operations side to really understand, you know, connect them to the work that Amnesty was doing. Um, and Sharif al Sayed Ali came and spoke to, to, to the operations team, did a presentation about um, what uh, Amnesty was doing with uh, technology and, and human rights. And I was so excited by his talk and I went and spoke to, to Richard and said, um, you know, could I, could I go and do some work with Sharif? He said, it seemed really interesting. And he gave me the opportunity to spend a day a week um, working with the Amnesty Tech team. I helped them set up the, the program and got more closer and closer to the work. Um, and that's how I got to know Sharif, who, who is uh, now my, my, my co-founder and CEO wow. at Carbonry. How amazing. And so I think, you know, like, as you said, there, brilliant um, testimony for just going into organisations really early stage and then kind of building your way up through them, showing that work ethic. And you, you just never know who you might meet there through that time and what it might lead to. So how amazing. Um, and so, I mean, with with, as you say, this sort of portfolio career and all these incredible different experiences, um, what do you think some of the most important things that you have learned through that time would be? Big question, sorry, but <laughs> like there are some themes through that. Um, I think personal relationships, obviously that has been the thing that's seen me through and how important that is, uh, helps you get through day to day, but also being able to get on with everyone, uh, with, you know, role, position in the company, um, and, and just being willing to roll up your sleeves and get jobs done. People, yeah. people, you know, and that has given me an exposure and that's been fantastic to become a COO because you really do have that full gamut. I, I've, you know, IT, legal, campaigning, comms, yeah. everything I could do, I would want to get involved in and you get that exposure by, you know, making friends with, you know, leaders in other, uh, other departments, just getting out there and being available and willing um, yeah. and nurturing those relationships as you go. Um, it's just made the job interesting. Obviously, I was doing my day job as well, so there was a little bit of overtime to, to, to push myself forward in that space. Without any agenda, just for, for the interest and, and the enthusiasm, it really, really helps when you believe in the cause because that's what gives you the, the motivation and the energy to keep on going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. And, and you know, startup world isn't isn't easy. So having that passion and that, yeah, exactly, that really drives you forward, doesn't it? Amazing. Um, and, and what are some kind of career highlights from that time as well? So, you know, all, all of these different kind of impactful organisations, were there any particular career highlights that you'd pull out where you just thought, I'm so lucky to be doing this? Well, it was a brief foray when I, as you mentioned, I went into to the film industry. Um, mm. My, um, what, what, after I left Amnesty International, and so after I left the Animal Welfare Foundation, um, I actually took um, a few months off. Um, ended up um, doing volunteer work in Thailand after the 2004 tsunami. Uh -huh. um, I worked on a project called Taikir. We we're building uh, <laughs> Ikea style furniture. Oh, um, <laughs> <I knew> that. <laughs> um, and that sort of gave me pause to time to pause and think about where I wanted to go. And I thought, you know, yeah. entering the world uh, with 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 no um, job, you know, had had nothing lined up. And so I I go to make hard hitting documentaries that will get seen by a handful of people at the EU, but that will you know have fundamentally change policy. So I'm, this is what I'm going to do. So I am um, just again people you know being available, willing to, yeah. to be a runner, landed on this film, nothing to do with um, uh, sort of uh, ch changing policy, um, but it was a, a Ridley Scott production um, uh, directed by uh, a famous director called Kevin MacDonald. Um, and it was a program, a film, docu-film called Life in a Day. Um, and that was, it was uh, a time capsule of life on this planet in, on the 24th of July, 2007, I think it was. Right. Um, and just, you know, very happy to have left the film industry. It was not for me, but as a, as a, like a, a career highlight, something just so balmy and, and strange, um, uh, that was, yeah, so certainly one that stuck out. Um, yeah. but essentially what I learned from that was all, all jobs are, you graft, you work, you, <laughs> sometimes you're sitting at a desk, sometimes you're having meetings. Um, uh, and, uh, I didn't really feel that that was the right place for me to make change and that's when I took the step into Amnesty International. 
Fair enough, fair enough. And so you, you talked us through there a bit about how you met Sharif. Um, how did you meet um, the other co-founder of um, Carbon Re and talk, talk me through how, how you all came together to, to kind of germinate this idea and, and, and get it off the ground? Uh, well, absolutely. So um, after seven years, Sharif, um, uh, of me being at Amnesty, and Sharif told me that um, he was moving on to um, a, a private company that had been doing sort of free consultancy work for Amnesty. So stepping over to the other side, a company called Element AI. And he went over to work on the, the AI for Good program. And I said, take me with you. Um, so he did. Um, and while we were there, he established um, that program as the AI for Climate program. I was the, the partnerships manager, so we were working together formally, closely to, for the first time. Um, and we were there for like 18 months. And while we were there, we met Daniel Summerbell, who's our, our, our co-founder CSO. Um, and we started working on um, sort of the, the precursor to what um, Carbon Ray is now, looking at manufacturing, looking at the, the really hard to abate sectors, the, the big challenges um, in terms of car carbon emissions. And um, having spent sort of however many years of my career working sort of in the background and, and, and helping people write reports to raise awareness or um, uh, sort of get policies changed, we suddenly were presented with this opportunity where we could have a direct impact on those carbon emissions. So taking Dan's PhD research um, and some process improvement in the cement industry and then combining it with this incredible AI talent that we had at Element AI at the time. And that gave, we had about six months of really sort of scoping out what that could look like. Um, Element AI was actually acquired by ServiceNow in late 2020. So they closed the program shortly before that acquisition took place. Sharif and I were given a, a small amount of redundancy. Um, COVID was uh, raging. Um, so we found ourselves out without, without a job in the middle of a COVID and but had this, this seed for this fantastic business idea and this, uh, this amazing opportunity with, um, with Dan. Um, and, and so Carbon Ray came from there. We ended, uh, my contract ended with Element AI on the 30th of September. On 12th of October, we had incorporated Carbon Ray um, and uh, brought in uh, Aidan O'Sullivan as a fourth co-founder. Uh, who was a contact um, through uh, Sharif, and we are we are the dream team, which brings Amazing. together what, what we are today. There you go. Um, and so that the idea then that was something that you were working on formally through Element AI. Yes, that, that yes. was sort of the focus of your work. It wasn't a sort of side thing you were talking about in the pub in the evenings outside. It, that was what you were working on. Yeah. And I mean, a, a, Element AI was a huge, huge company, and I, Sharif and I used to go for our walk and talks and go, you know, th this this is an idea in itself. You know, there there could be so much impact that we could have here. So we'd we'd already been thinking of that it, sh it should be broader than a than a small program um and and actually you know there, there are iterations of it the carbon ray now is is quite different um but that was that was that's where the seeds happened and where we sort of sort of sitting around looking at other people running businesses and thinking no yeah maybe maybe we could do it ourselves yeah and it was that acquisition and that redundancy was that was just that final and, thing and, and covid that. and covid <laughs> that push over there. Do you know, there are so many, um, and I suppose it would be the case because I'm speaking on this series to early stage co-founders, right? So most of those are sub five years and COVID has been a significant part of that, but it really has, you know, for let's, you know, let's not discount all of the, you know, awful consequences of what happened with the pandemic, but it has, there have been some really fantastic businesses that have come up through it that perhaps wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and Charlie, who I was speaking to um, on Wednesday, um, co-founder of a business called Echo, said if it hadn't been for the pandemic and the fact that he was working from home, he wouldn't have had the time and the space between calls to to work on things that have now turned into the business he's running today. So, yeah, I think as as with your scenario, it kind of it, it did give a lot of businesses the opportunity or or push people over the line into thinking, no, actually, I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going to take action. And that's certainly true for me personally. Um, I think Sharif has had always had his eye on on on. on bigger things and he has you know he is the driver behind uh, what we're doing and the, the big ambition so I'm a quite quite a good counterweight to, to him with his uh, sky high <laughs> thinking and, and, and the day-to-day -day pragmatism comes from me.
Yeah. Oh, you need that balance. So talk me through that balance then between the four of you and how you kind of, you know, you came. So you and Sharif had worked together before. Then you, the two of you worked with Dan as a three, but Aidan coming into it knew Sharif, but was newer to, to the dynamic. So how does that dynamic between the four of you work? And what, what does that feel like as a, as a leadership? It's fantastic, team? actually. And I, I, I didn't even meet um, uh, Aidan in person for the first sort of six months because, because of all the lockdowns. So it was all, all, all online. Um, we all bring really unique skill sets uh, to the table. Um, so for Aiden, obviously the, the AI expert, the, the solutions, the, the um, um, from Dan, the ambition and the drive and the, the, the go-getting from, from Sharif. And then obviously I can say that the, the day-to-day uh, business management that, that I can bring to the table. So um, I think because of our our skill sets and our personalities. There's no, there's no sort of clashes. It's very clear why each of us is is it, it, on the team, so to yeah. speak. Um, and again, really having that singular mission. We all know what we're trying to do. We're all driving in the same space. Yeah. Um, I've used this example previously about sort of human rights. My versions of what is you know, human rights might be very different to your version of human rights in terms of I don't know. Uh, I'm pro-choice and you're pro-life. Yeah. We say we both have passion for human rights, but they, they might be polarised and actually yeah. bringing those voices together is a real challenge. When it comes to climate impact, we all know what the problem is. We're all driving in the same direction. We would like to have a successful business because that is going to enable us to have the impact on the, on, on, on the climate that we want to have. We've gone for the, the hardest to tackle problems because we don't really have a choice. Mm. Yeah, no, you're so right. It, yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a very objective problem isn't it with a very clear solution and we just all have to get together and drive at that solution um, and and as I said at the you know at the beginning of this conversation I think the solution that Carbonary are proposing and are working on and developing is honestly one of the most impactful I've I've ever heard so uh, in your words because you will describe it far better than me do you want to share with everybody listening exactly what problem you're solving and, and how you're solving it yeah so we are well, talking about the hard to abate sectors, um, the energy intensive industries that account for about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're ta- starting with cement, which uh, accounts for about 8% of glo- global greenhouse gas emissions alone. Uh, we are focusing on the first instance, our first product called Delta Zero, which is about process efficiency and optimization. It's AI powered software that sits in the cloud and um, provides recommendations to cement plant operators that help them really reduce the amount of um, fuel that they're burning and and the associated carbon emissions with that. And this is just our first product. We have huge ambitions for where we can we, where we can take and where we can build on, on, on that first one. We wanted to get a foothold in the industry, start generating that revenue, and we, we you know we'll, we'll build out from there. Um, the other industries that we're, we're looking at include steel, glass, um, we could even move out to sort of ke- petrochemicals, data centers. There's you know the world's our oyster, but you know we, we're <laughs> one 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 step at a time but we are you know our, our company mission is to reduce gigatons of carbon emissions uh, annually and to do that we need to be global and we need to to go into to, to many other sectors um so so that's our our, our our starting point is delta zero process process optimization in cement phenomenal i remember a stat that dan some of our um your uh, CSO told me, um, which is that for every one cement plant that were to use your technology, it would reduce emissions by the equivalent of a thousand, like a, a thousand lifetimes. So the same amount of emissions that one human being would expel in their entire lifetime end to end, just one cement plant using your technology is a thousand people's footprints just wiped out. How incredible. So my, my mission, uh, I, I won't be around to see it, but my epitaph, my gravestone, I'm going to have the number of carbon tons that we reduced um, oh, yeah. on, on my grave, gravestone. So that's that's yeah. fairly morbid. Yeah, but what <laughs> um, a legacy. Amazing. <laughs> Lovely. I love that. Um, so those early, early months then, the four of you, mid-COVID, mid-lockdowns, building a business, the four of you, some of whom had never met in real per- in real life, building a business virtually, what what did that what did that look like? How did you tackle this? How did you get off the ground? How was it funded? What were the what were the practicalities of those early months? 
My goodness. I mean, just looking back on some of the uh, the, the first sort of uh, pitch decks and things like that that we um, <laughs> we did early on coming up with the concept and, and how would we we'd build the idea. Um, I got to uh, see Sharif occasionally in his uh, garden office, but mostly it was all online, um, completely self-funded um, for the first sort of six, eight months. Um, you know, we had had a little bit of savings from from COVID, and I I lived with my mum and dad for two or three months, um, and I certainly hadn't had any outgoing uh, expenditure other than my my day to day rent. Um, so we're able to to put a you know limited savings that we did have into the company to to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, but Daniel is from the University of uh, Cambridge, and um, Aidan's uh, associate professor. Of AI and energy systems at UCL. So quite early on, we identified this as an opportunity to get um, some some setup um, funding. Wow. Initially, that was going to be a fast seventy five grant from um, from uh, Cambridge University. Uh, then spun out into a much bigger pre seed round. So that took took quite a long time to get off the ground. Um, but by sort of, uh, sort of between or between. August and and, and um, October the following year, we'd um, we'd, we'd ha had our first funding round of, of about a million, just over a million pounds, oh, wow. um, with with UCL and Cambridge um, uh, in investing in us. So that was, you know, kept kept us going uh, and enabled us to start providing a, a small salary and, and hire our first few people. Amazing. Um, and who were those first few you hired? What did that? How how did you know it's time for us to hire now? And when you did set out doing that, how how did you go and find those people and sort of get off the ground as employers, as it were? Well, Kiara, um, uh, number one, and we we always like to call her our first employer. She's an um, employee, uh, machine learning engineer, fantastic. She's absolutely amazing. She was actually um, somebody that um, Aidan knew through the MSc program, which he, he teaches at UCL. So it was a personal um, uh, introduction, um, and then. Uh, we, we dragged her in just before she was, uh, while she was trying to finalise her, her um, MSc. Um, but so she was our first, our first employee. And then we closed the round. We, we were very, very lucky to have uh, Nantas uh, Nadelli join us, um, who was just finishing off his PhD at Oxford University at the time um, and had you know, incredible amounts of experience as a senior research um, scientist and, and sort of really, really building out from there. So we, we, we'd lent on, on Dan and, and um, uh, Aidan for the sort of the, the prototyping, the product development, and Sharif and I were setting up the business, chasing the money. Um, but yeah, actually time, time to roll our sleeves up and actually start building um, things. And that's when we had to start really you know, increasing the size of the team. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And not not the easiest thing to do. So, yeah, sounds like you found two really stellar hires. We, immediately. We were very, way. very lucky. And uh, yeah, very, very pleased to have them still with us. Yeah. And so how has the business evolved then from just being the four of you and making those first two hires to where you guys are today? Talk, talk me through what that last kind of how long so, has that been? Wow. Two yeah, years? We 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 celebrated our second um, anniversary on the on the 12th of october which oh. coincidentally happened to be the same day that we, we closed our last funding round so we got the, the messages from the lawyers um as we were standing around our cake in our new office with sort of 20 odd staff thinking two years ago it was you know all of us four people online um uh, to, to have grown so so much uh, in that time it's been quite extraordinary uh, we've got you know good good team there's yeah so there's about 20 of us about 16 of us based in in London a few consultants a few type part-time staff um, but a really brilliant kind hard-working team um, and really sort of to the point I made about the the, the co-founding team really passionate about the impact that we can have and really motivated by by the mission whilst also in like dealing with a really interesting intellectual academic challenge of cutting edge AI this hasn't been done before and so we're pushing the boundaries of, of what can be can be done amazing yeah and and how much has the business or the product I suppose the offering evolved and changed since those first days is it is it massively different where you sit today to to what you were kind of first scoping out in those early months yeah we were very lucky to have um, an early trial um, based in India for the first few months of um, I can't remember which year in this year I think <laughs> Um, uh, and that was, you know, really sort of learning exercise. There was a lot of back and forth. Um, I think that the, the back end of the product will look very, very different now and, and our approach, but it was um, 
really predominantly the, the speed at which we can set up the way that we can extract data um, and, and the, the you know the dashboard that the recommender system that um, that the plant operators see you know doesn't look vastly different but it's got some really good features in it much more um, you know the things that we learned that the plant operators want to be able to see and, and use the platform for have really the, the, those additional features have really evolved and you know, obviously the the modeling and the techn technical side behind it is is you know in advancing daily yeah well, so that's really great so there's been no sort of major pivot or change in terms of what you're doing and how you're doing it it's just been evolving it fine-tuning it and just making it the best it can possibly be yeah. to solve and we've, we've been really lucky we've got you know had a lot of interest from from the cement industry um who are you know they they know this is coming they know that they need to to, to make fundamental change not least because the fuel prices are escalating wow. uh, considerably um but they you know they're aware of that the carbon emissions there is the, the threat of carbon taxation in, in 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 Europe but even in places where that doesn't impact them that you know they, they are aware of the, the CO2 um, uh, impact of of the production mm -hmm. um so there's been a lot of pull from that um that sector a lot of interest so we've got a pipeline that's sort of almost bigger than we the team that we've we've got can can deliver so that's why we're sort of really pushing to to, to grow the team and, and, and get get people in so and and as we do that the, the product will evolve it will develop there are you know new new features new um add-ons that we, we want to sort of develop over time so that the product in in several years will have look very different from it the one it does today but it will still have these fundamental process efficiency features that mean that you know really quickly you can be reducing your your fuel use and your carbon emissions yeah and i think what's so compelling about it as well is the fact that it's these reductions that can be made now like a cement plant starts using this and it will reduce emissions it's it is reducing the amount of carbon dioxide and equivalents going into the atmosphere immediately isn't it Absolutely. And I think there's such interesting um, sort of new technologies emerging. I've met some fantastic other startups in this space, the, you know, the industry contact conferences that we're going to. There's some brilliant novel technology um, out there, but it's just not ready yet. It's not ready to scale. It's not ready to implement. And pretty much no matter what you do, um, process optimization, what Carbon Ray's first offering will always be relevant. Yeah. for carbon capture and storage to work for you know we, we can be you know a part of those solutions that are emerging in the future we'll be developing our own solutions to, to add, add to that but we really wanted to have something that would start having impact today yeah fantastic and so that moment of being kind of two years in second year birthday standing around the cake and getting the the letter from the, the message from the lawyers and that message from the lawyers was that you've closed your seed funding round and you've secured 4.2 million is that correct absolutely uh, and as a director and a person who gets to look at the bank account that was a very exciting moment i have to say I bet. <laughs> <laughs> like how many zeros yeah <laughs> lovely um and so what's what's that money going to enable you to do what are you planning you know what what does this next 12 months bring for for carbon Ray? absolutely so really it's 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 runway we are going to build the team develop product we are still at trial stage at the moment. We've got you know, three, three or four customers um, trialing the product and, 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 and the pipeline, as I mentioned, is, is, is even longer than that. So we, we're going to build out that product, start getting revenue, convert those into um, uh, you know, uh, license agreements and, um, and, and go from there, really. So it's, it's really it's embedding the growth of a company. Um, we you know, begin looking at maybe sort of geographical expansion, maybe having presence um, sort of in, in, in the US. We already have somebody in India and somebody in Thailand at the moment. But the, you know, since cement production is a global business, um, we need to have people sort of on the ground and able to support support, support the sales, but also um, manage the accounts once they're, once they're up and running. So getting those those first few conversions, that, that revenue in early on, obviously it's a key uh, interest of our investors. Um, but building that traction, get, getting getting into the businesses, getting looking at the data and then seeing how we can build and support them as they you know, go through the, the decarbonisation journey. Yeah, that's amazing. So yeah, there's a, a clear problem that needs solving, uh, a line as long as your arm of people that want to, to buy the solution and you've got the technology, you've got the solution, it's just a case of hiring the people to make it scalable. 
um, what a lovely problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> and this, and, and the, there's a lot, there's not lots been done with this data. There's a lot that can be done. Like we'll say, we're, we're looking at a, a first challenge, but like seeing the opportunities with the digital twin, that, you know, where, where there are savings, where there are new ways of working, um, we need, you know, that, that kick-ass team of sort of AI uh, talent to, to be able to explore that and model it and, 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 and make that product better and better. Fantastic. Well, there you go. So if anybody listening to this is, is working in AI or machine learning or software engineering in any capacity and has a passion for wanting to reduce carbon emissions and make the world a better place, then um, have a look at Carbon Ray's website, have a look at the careers page and, um, yeah, um, they, they need your help. Um, perfect. So um, I, I always round out by doing three quick fire questions. Um, so the first one being, what would be your top piece of advice for somebody who's thinking about setting up their business but just needs, you know, that, that extra push? What would you say? Well, for me, the extra push was uh, Sharif. Uh, having, ha I don't think I would have ever done this. I know, I know I would never have done this on my own. So having a team around me of people who are pulling in the same direction that we can, you know, the days that you're exhausted and they can pick you up. So having somebody, an ally who can help you out um, and go on that journey with you, for me, was fundamental. So so find find yourself a Sharif. There you go. And if and, and again, if so another chat out there, if anybody's listening to this that, um, you know, here's that advice and things that's great but where am I going to find my co-founder um you've got what is it four days five days now to apply to the next carbon 13 cohort um so for any of you that don't know carbon 13 is a venture builder um they've got a UK chapter and they've got a Berlin chapter um and it is where people go if they have a fantastic idea to sort of solve climate change but they just need people around them to help them work on that idea um so if you if you either have an idea and you need a team or you want to go and join a team and find someone that's got an idea and help them solve the problem that's a great place to go so quick shout out on the side for them um and second question which business or sustainability role model do you wish you could just spend one hour with well i'm going for robert downey jr who oh. is obviously iron man <laughs> but has set up the Footprint Coalition, um, which is uh, Impact Investor, but also they, they provide charitable grants um, for uh, advancing climate tech. So if I had an opportunity to sit in a room for an hour, in an hour with um, uh, Robert Downey Jr., that would make my day. And you can tell him all about your filmmaking experience. <laughs> Do you know, I didn't know he was doing that. That's absolutely amazing. I'll go and look that up after this. Um, and the third question is, what is one quick lifestyle change that you could recommend to the listeners to help them live more sustainably? Just one quick thing, quick and easy thing that they could do. No, I really struggled over this one. Um, I'm going with write to your MP, Ooh. which is uh, controversial. We all know that we should have keepy cups and canvas bags and not drive and not fly and all the things that, you know, eat less meat or no meat. Yeah. Um, but the problems that we're trying to tackle, we're trying, you know, the day-to-day -day changes that I can make are a drop in the ocean. We really need to lobby big companies to actually have sustainability goals, talk to Shell or you know, the big oils, the, the big techs that have, have resources to make change mm. and can make fundamental change. And they need to put their money where their mouth is and actually deliver. So I'd go lo lobby through your MP. That's amazing. And are there easy ways people can do that? Because that's something I'll, I'll be honest, you know, it, as somebody that I think is quite proactive and engaged and, you know, I, I haven't ever done that. Um, is there an easy way if you think I want to write to my MP, are there templates or letters that people can access? And you can just that? honestly, you can you can send them an email online. You go to your MP, your local MP, go to their website, find find their email address. Uh, it's all available online. If you want to follow a campaign, uh, they're like change.org. There's lots of Greenpeace. They are you know brilliant organisations that are, are lobbying for change. So you can sign petitions and do it that way. Um, but you know, you, you, ev everyone has the right just to sit down and write an email to your MP. I used to be the person who has to had to reply um, on behalf of the MP that I was working for. You, you're, you're due a response. Um, and the more people that you know are, are talking about the same thing, the more voices that we have. This is the change that we want to see from these big companies, um, who you know, some of them don't even have zero carbon targets or if they do they're almost meaningless we need to see action and we need to put that pressure on them amazing 
Thank you so much. Well, there you go. If anyone's looking for something to do on a Friday afternoon, head here first, go and write to your MP. Wonderful. Buffy, thank you so, so much um, for sharing that with us this afternoon and for taking time out of your very busy day um, to, to kind of share your journey with us. I really appreciate it. Um, and as I said before, you know, a wonderful company doing really important work. So um, if you want to read up more about them after this, please go and check their website out. Thank you so much. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. You too.